And here we go. So welcome everybody. See good attendance today. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to Mr. Hussein Shakir from the Arabic Emirates. Um, this is a good one. Uh, I'll leave the stage to you, Hussein, to display what you are doing on that end of the world. So we're pretty curious to know more into your universe to get acquainted to you. So it's, it's an honor for us to have you today with us and leave the stage to you to, to start presenting your company, what you're doing, what the current projects and for the future ones. Thank you, Andrea, first of all, for a very, very warm welcome. And uh, I mean, we have a great crowd here and I want to make it worth uh, the next 30, 35, 40 minutes uh, to give you a glimpse into what we are doing here in the Arab Emirates with uh, in the blockchain world, or to be more specific in the hyperledger blockchain world, the private permission blockchain world. Um, and then UA Trade Connect, um, as the name suggests, it's, it's, it's turning into the national trade finance platform for the region. We do have the first use case um, already live for about 13 months and have some interesting stats. Um, and, and the main purpose of, of this first use case and how this, this lays a foundation for uh, where we think um, very soon we are progressing towards. A lot is happening um, as we speak. Um, I'll give you a glimpse of, of how the journey came about, how the platform operates, uh, the power of blockchain, which is very subtle, but um, indeed doing a fabulous job behind the scenes and how this translates into an exciting future for us. So in terms of agenda again, um, Let's understand how the first use came together. And in strength for any, any blockchain play, I strongly personally believe it's all about co-creation. It's how about, it's how you put a consortium together. Um, it's how you have a steering committee of your consortium members that drive it forward. And that's, that's the, that's the um, key element um, of, of, a, of success for any, any blockchain, um, at least private permission blockchain output. Um, then I want to have, have a quick video, about 90, 95 seconds, that will take you through how the system operates in, in layman's words. I mean, for the technologists on the forum, uh, they would be mapping it in their head um, onto which node and which smart contract are we invoking. Uh, success of the system in terms of numbers. And then I want to just give a glimpse of how we see this as, as one potential roadmap for ourselves going forward. Okay, so what I'm going to start with is, is talking about the first use case. UTC, which we use as, as a, I would say, as a abbreviation for UAE Trade Connect. Um, the idea was to address the fraud risks in the trade finance space. But this use case um, was identified by the banks. And in, in terms of risks in the present environment, so we all know that when it comes to trade finance, whether it's about um, invoice discounting, factoring, reverse factoring, trust receipts, you know, so many flavors of the same thing. Um, we, we know that a customer walks into bank A, says, hey, I did a million dollar business. Uh, my cash is gonna be realized about a few months down the road, but I'm looking for quick working capital. Um, the banks will do the due diligence, uh, make sure the KYC is good, make sure the transaction is, um, is is decent and they will go ahead and, and finance. But that doesn't stop the uh, company from walking into bank B with the same document, right? And this is what is an, is an industry-wide blind spot. Um, and we picked it up as the first use case because, uh, you know, to de-risk the trade finance environment, to have the banks build the confidence of lending and eventually, you know, propagating the economy, we need to, we had to address this as, as the beginning of our journey. Um, and it's not just that a, that a company takes an invoice to do it, they could take it to multiple banks. And we do know that uh, the underlying risk of over invoicing, under invoicing, just paper based trade, they all exist. And this, this is the journey that we've embarked on. And <clears throat> this, this is where I, you know, I, I said earlier that the, the power of blockchain, I think, is, is very synonymous to, to, to consortium. It, it's, it's all of a consortium play. 
And this is how our journey started. Back in 2018, uh, one of the leading banks of UAE, you know, came to uh, the telecom company in the region, the largest telecom company, Etisalat, which is now known as the EN uh, Group. They, they came, they said, this is an industry-wide problem. What can we do to, to solve it? Well, if it's an industry-wide problem, what we do need is we need to have um, all the banks in it. So we invited all the banks, seven of the more agile, more, um, I would say, you know, ready to tackle a problem kind of bank said, um, let's form a consortium. So seven banks, Etisalat, the uh, anchor telecom provider in the country and a technology partner, they, they got together. Um, and in all these banks on the top were the ones that started the journey with us. And these are all household names in the region um, from First Abu Dhabi Bank to Emirates NBD to Rack Bank, National Bank of Fujairah, um, CBI, Mashrik, and Commercial Bank of Dubai. So what we did was created a consortium that said, you know, we need to co-create. We need, we, need, we need to work together to solve this industry-wide problem. And we are lucky because back in August 2020, the Central Bank um, of UAE joined the steering committee of the program in an observation capacity, right? But I mean, as being a big, the regulator, all the guidelines started flowing from them in terms of what we should more than what we should do, what we should not do, you know, how to ensure integrity, how to ensure data privacy and data protection, um, how to establish communication channels, and how to basically establish a working relationship for banks. And this is this is the and understand back in 18, 19, 20, this is still a new concept. Uh, at a very high level, it was an exploration concept, but that turned into, into a reality when we turned it around in, in a few months to a pilot. Uh, program and we allowed our banks to basically um, not just test it but but simulate a, a real life uh, culture of how it would work. Gave ourselves six to eight months to test the platform out. And last year in April, um, I believe the date was nineteenth April, is when we launched the platform with the first use case of invoice deduplication. And um, you know it, it was it was uh, I would not say it was a runaway success. Um, like all platforms had its challenges with adoption, but you know it, it's it's a very different picture today. When I would present the stats in a few slides, you'll see that um, that growth, that that marketing, that trust of the banks um, got us to a position where we were, you know, the platform was looked as 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 one of the key enablers and was proposed to be part of the national financial infrastructure initiative of the country. And the 2022 this year started with the bank because we onboarded not only the largest Islamic bank in the country, the Islamic bank, but we also onboarded one of the uh, very active bank in the, in the retail segment, Abu Dhabi Commercial Bank. Um, and just like all the learnings that were, that were passed on from our founding members, they all go into the into a very structured onboarding program uh, that enables and that, that allows uh, incoming banks to to onboard themselves in a, in a, in a very small uh, period of time. And and what looks like here is the, is the nine logos, uh, very powerful logos, well, where it's going. And you know, uh, pro because we are under NDA of uh, with so many other prospects right now I and mean, I can't put those logos but but it's 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 a very thick pipeline if, if I were to use that word and it's not only just the banks but you know the the alternate lending environment has also taken a notice and because it's a blind spot we all need to work towards it to ensure that you know we, we minimize the blind spot um, with that I mean now that I've given the background of how things have come about the power of co-creation the power of the consortium. Let me take you through a 90 odd second video, which will give you a glimpse into how the system works. It's in layman's words, um, but still tries to explain, you know, blockchain to, to people uh, who don't come from a technology background. And probably at the, at the end of the video, if there are any queries, it would be a good time to, to maybe address them. Um, and with that, I will play the video.
UAE, UAE Trade, Trade Connect, Connect is an award-winning consortium, consortium learner, first of its, first of its kind, digital, digital national, national, national trade, trade finance, finance platform, featuring cutting-edge featuring technology, cutting edge technology based, on based on blockchain, artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence and machine learning, learning technologies. technologies. The first use case offered on the platform is the fraud detection and identification of duplicate invoices financed by banks as part of their trade finance offering. Here is how UTC adds value through five simple steps. 1. A bank submits invoice information onto our private permission blockchain platform through their node. 2. The selected, the selected information required for fraud detection, fraud detection is replicated to the UTC node using contracts. smart contracts. Three. Three. This information, this is, then information is then pushed into the fraud investigation engine, engine which, performs which performs duplicate checks and risk assessment. And risk assessment. Four. Based, Four. On Based on the fraud checks, the bank will be notified as follows. A. Pass. Clean invoice, clean which, invoice may which may be financed or B. Fail. B fail. Major, issues Major issues identified or a duplicate invoice. Do not proceed or C. Inspect. Banks' further investigation is required since a high-risk score has been determined. 5. Final action taken by the bank with respect to financing the invoice is securely saved onto the blockchain. The selected invoice data, risk assessment outcome, and the final action taken by the bank is chronologically stamped onto the blockchain network, and that, combined with the immutability of data, ensures tamper-proof and distributed storage of sensitive information. Atisalat Cloud Services hosts the solution within the United Arab Emirates, ensuring compliance with central bank's regulations. The central bank has also endorsed UTC's unique proposition as well as data sharing architecture among banks. UAE Trade Connect benefits both banks and their clients by reducing fraud, enabling the banks to share knowledge of duplicate invoices without sharing any sensitive information, enhancing finance for corporates and SMEs. UAE Trade Connect Built by the banks, for the banks. And I think we, we do live by the tagline that this is built by the banks, for the banks. And, and I think this, this is, again, you know, a very important pillar um, in our, in our storyline. This, uh, this is, the I would say, the most important element of our journey so far. And now, now what the video was trying to explain, let me articulate that in a in a step-by-step -step, um, real scenario that happened with us back in December of last year. This is a real case, uh, no names, um, but more importantly, it will it will help you, uh, the audience, understand um, what is actually happening. So, uh, a seller, which is which was um, you know a manpower company servicing um, large entities, you know, government, semi-government level entities, um, had a pack of two invoices um, and they approached their bank A, well, the ones they banked with and said, you know, we are looking for some receivable financing on this. Uh, so the bank said, okay, great. Let us do the due diligence on you. KYC comes out good. Uh, and they said, well, we now have a new system called UA Trade Connect. Let's submit the invoices as, as a final check against the system. Because the system had not seen those invoices, marked them as clean, the banks decided um, to finance those invoices. And they stamped it onto the blockchain network that they have financed them. About three weeks later, the same seller approached Bank B with the same set of invoices and said, we'd like to apply for some quick financing. Uh, the bank said, well, let's do our due diligence and the last mile check um, against the UTC system. And the UTC system this time identified the invoice um, as a duplicate, flagged it as a failed instance, and more importantly, notified Bank A that the invoices that were presented to you three weeks back have shown up somewhere else. Now, the beauty of the system is this, this fraud was running in about 4 million uh, or about a million euro, um, a little over a million dollars right now, no, given the conversion rate, a little over a million euro as well right now. Um, and Bank A was notified that the invoices they had seen a few weeks back had been presented to Bank B. Bank B was informed correctly at the time of transaction that these invoices have appeared on the network. 
The beauty is bank A doesn't know bank B, bank B doesn't know A, bank A, yet all the parties involved in this potential, what could have been a fraud, were informed correctly and on time. And the banks took their corrective action, whatever they did, post their investigation. But had a system like this not existed, um, this would have easily passed through and there would be no policing around it. Now, when I Usain, move is into... Hussain, is, is it okay yes, to interrupt? Okay to interrupt? Yes, for yes, a minute, please, yes. For a sure, yeah, sure. Hussain, Hussain, uh, in yeah. this case, if Bank B hasn't been, you know, uh, part of your UAE Trade Connect, would they able to identify this issue? No, no, of course no, because it, that, that's the blind spot. Right? I mean, if, if the banks are in the network and we are, you know, working towards having yeah. all the banks yeah. that deal in this trade finance product to be on the network. Once they, everybody uh, is, they are 100%. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With the logos yeah. you saw yeah. earlier, um, I, there's a very significant percentage of the market that we already covered. And given yes. the pipeline yes. that I can't share, we are we are getting very close to- Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Sorry, Usain. Yeah, you we proceed, please. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. we expected to grow uh, to about 85 to 90% coverage uh, by early next year. Okay. 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 And uh, one more, one more, uh, one more quick uh, query, you saying. So, uh, is this this invoice uh, fraud? You know, they, this whichever you know, uh, it's a beautiful uh, concept. You know, within the trade, trade finance, because you know, this is the first step of you know, like you know, between the exporter and importer, the things will happen. And what I just want to check it out is, is it uh, for all the you know, like uh, invoicing, like you know, e even letter of credits and bill of lading, that has also been checked by your uh, system, or only a general invoicing? No, that's, that's in fact a very good question. So our consortium, which is again run by the banks, have decided that as far as the borrower is in the UAE originating, the borrowing is originating in UAE, irrespective okay. of the counterparty where they belong to, and irrespective of what kind of a transaction it is, open account, LC, um, yeah. or any other yeah. arrangements. But if a trade invoice is involved, then they yep. should run it yep. against the system as a last mile check before they are okay to go ahead and finance it. So we're getting okay. the whole, no. whole nine yards in all possible yes. currencies that our respective banks are dealing in and irrespective of the product, you know, factoring, discounting, LC oriented, because what could be an LC for bank A could be an open account transaction for bank B. And if you yeah. don't run it through the system, then again, a blind spot. Hence, okay. they're putting in the, uh, all, the, all the volumes that they have come across. Okay. Uh, thank you, Usain. Fantastic achievement by your team. As in, like, you know, we are just started to explore this uh, from India. As in, like, you know, RBA has just given a go ahead for, uh, you know, to start this particular project as such, you know, to explore with the trade finance. But I think, you know, you people are a bit advanced on that and, you know, really, you know, nice to see this, you know, coming in. And uh, I think blockchain is one of the things, you know, which is going to disrupt this trade finance world. And I seriously believe that, you know, once blockchain is getting explored i think you know shift is something you know which is going to get a huge change and i believe on uh, cbdc and central yeah. bank digital currency once it gets implemented right i think i you know only buyer seller and one intermediary safia and, uh, really, yeah safia thank you Let, let's go ahead with the presentation that we can recap you see during the question and answer time at the end of the speech yeah yeah definitely definitely sorry 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 i think you know no, I no, no worries. yeah yeah no, i, I got it yeah. i got it yeah, Great input. And we started yeah. our journey probably mirroring some some of the other achievements across the globe uh, but our success story as has been our own um, and i'm sure your journey has started and and if there's anything that we can help uh, we, we can engage we'll be very happy to share our experiences with you in terms of the the success of the system so if if i were to put this in plain numbers um, and I would say this is about 43 billion dirhams in local currency. We're looking at what about 13 odd, 14 odd billion euro or dollars today. Uh, that's the value of invoices that has already been validated, inspected on the platform by uh, eight out of nine our banks. So the ninth bank is still just coming in, but I would say the volumes from eight banks have already started hitting. This is this is what we have we have as a number. And this is this is pretty latest, but I mean 
this is from yesterday or day before, and I'm sure it's jumped a few millions here or there. And the average ticket size, what we are looking at is about 50 to $60,000 um, or euro. Um, it's, it's a significant ticket size, even on average value. And some tickets are really, really high. Um, and, and on a monthly basis, I mean, the volume has started now going upwards of 30,000 invoices with about um, 1.3 billion um, USD or Euro per month. Um, and if, if you look at the curve, you know, it's, it's just going upwards. Um, and, and the system is working as designed, right? The system is working as designed. Why I say this? Because so far, we have already found 20 interbank duplicates. Uh, now the value may not look very high. Um, it's, it's a two and a half, three million USD euro, but the beauty is that the system has picked up um, exact matches to a little bit of fuzzy matches, but more importantly, seven out of our eight network banks have seen a duplicate and it's consistent now. Every month we've seen five to six duplicates uh, with decent value, decent ticket sizes. Um, and, you know, on the record, we have that um, the customers, I mean, the investigation within the banks have led to uh, blacklisting the customers where it was a fraudulent intent to actually understanding why the, you know, banks looking at their own processes and um, improvise, you know, improving them as they go along, because it was, it was, it was very um, important that somewhere within their system also, within their process also, they had to tackle this. Um, we, we had one very interesting case a few months back, and it, it deserves a mention here. So there's a pack of seven invoices um, by a, a huge automobile um, supplier uh, based out of uh, a free zone. And then they had a counter party, which was the distributor of, of their automobile uh, brand. It was worth um, about 15 to 17 million USD euro uh, when it was, it was presented. Um, so the first party that presented was a supplier, uh, was, was looking for supply side of financing. A few weeks later, the counterparty, which was looking for buyer side of financing, presented the invoice. The system picked it up as a, as a counterparty. It was a legit transaction. The supplier was getting the finance uh, first for the right reason, and then the buyer getting the finance and paying the supplier. Uh, but, but had a system like this not existed, this kind of a pattern, this kind of a trade, uh, this kind of an arrangement would not have been picked. Apart from that, I mean, there are the, the, the intra-bank duplicates. And again, I highlighted it could be because there, there's partial financing happening or there is a duplication uh, within the bank because it's coming through two different channels or through different RMs. Um, or it could be that within the bank, the processes are not uh, uh, you know, in line and they end up uploading the same invoice twice. I mean, that number is growing significantly. Uh, and on the right side, what I have is apart from checking the duplicates, what we also do is we give, we have a risk score engine on, on the invoices. And if you look at it, about three fourths of the invoices are absolutely clean. And uh, about one fifth of the invoices have low risk. What are low risk indicators? And this, this has been decided by the consortium. So an invoice which has more than five zeros um, as a total in an economy which is uh, VAT oriented, why do we have a round off? So those kind of triggers and it's an alert. If an invoice is more than 120 days old, uh, why are we financing that, that old an invoice? Uh, things like that, checks like that, something very meaningful. Uh, an invoice number uh, nomenclature, is it in line with the last time the same supplier presented it? Is it really off? Does it mean there is you know, something fishy going on? So those, those kind of elements are also flagged as the invoices go through our screening system. Now, I mean, it's, it's blockchain, so it's inherently uh, protected, it's inherently secure. But on top of that, I mean, what we, are, what we have today is a banking grade software used by the leading banks of UAE. Um, and it, it required that we had the highest level of security standards what we call banking grade standards, 
uh, were put around it. So apart from the system going through the VAPTs on a, on a very regular schedule to the entire system being CSL2 compliant, uh, the connectivity is through very secure tunnel. It's not like in public um, domain, it's, it's available for, for our hackers to go in. It's not, it's pretty secure. Um, and and the, the most important element is that apart from the leading banks certifying the technology and the security architecture uh, of the platform, the central bank, um, we had an opportunity to present um, and, and get their, uh, you know, get them to review and get them to um, endorse a, a blockchain based knowledge sharing model, which didn't exist uh, before we got in. So allowing the banks to share the data without sharing the data. Um, and more importantly, as banks are used to, we have a 24 by seven uh, SOC in place, um, you know, SIM solutions like Splunk are in place. So it's it's heavily guarded. Um, it has to be because it's, it's sensitive data. And again, data protection uh, security is actually at the very heart of the platform. And I think this probably is coming towards the end, and I hope I'm in time. Uh, where, where do we go from here? I mean, we, we have a, a beautiful journey so far. We expect that many, many banks are going to join us between now and early next year. And probably in, in a span of few months, we would be at a point that we would have covered the blind spot in the industry between 90 to 95 percent. And the 5 percent will follow eventually, will fall in place. Uh, but as a, as, a, as a roadmap, we believe that we, uh, we have a responsibility uh, being the, um, at a national level, at a nation level, to ensure that uh, the platform continues adding value to the defrauding and de-risking of trade. And, and you know, UAE is, is, is heavily, um, is, was one of the leading trade hubs of the world. Uh, so bringing this um, into the environment just makes it far more friendly for the businesses to, uh, you know, to propel. And, and, and we believe that adding um, TBML checks, uh, sanction screening, uh, dual usage goods checks, verifying the trade documents um, to looking at a more nationwide robust KYC, KYB um, as, as a given on the platform uh, and probably working with, with uh, the leading shipping lines of the world. And there are so many platforms today available for us to collaborate with. But if a bank had a visibility on um, the LC down to where the vessel was in the high seas, down to tracking their container, there will be a lot more confidence when it comes to you know, financing the, the traded hands. Um, aiding and taking, uh, uh, collaborating with customs, uh, we could we could kill another. Or we could tackle one of the one of the bigger problems of under invoicing when it comes through uh, the customs gates. So th these are all all um, eventual roadmaps. Most of them we have embarked upon. Uh, There's quite a lot of work done. We just had a major uh, release a week back where we enhanced the rule engine to look at far more permutations and combinations of potential duplicates. Um, and in, in subsequent months, this roadmap will start taking shape. Uh, and with that, I think I will open the floor for questions. I know that in the chat box, I do see a few yeah, questions. There is already one from my friend, Pam Sangha, by the way. Welcome back, Pam. It's glad to have you here. Uh, Pam basically is asking, what did the business case look like? But we create the service and then to offer it as a compelling service. Of course, Pam, feel free to say the word and ask. Uh, yeah, happy to. First of all, thank you very much for sharing. Uh, really good, uh, really good project and uh, and update. Uh, but hopefully, does the question make sense? Make sense? Because obviously, you've uh, it's designed by the banks for the bank keen to understand how they made the business case to invest to create the service, number one, and then obviously to consume it. So are you are you asking what was in it for the banks to come up with this service or how did the no, consortium? No, I, think, 
No, I think you explained it very well as to where the value is in as far as the avoidance of um, of double finance, and that's value there. How did you quantify the value to then determine how much money to invest in the creation of the platform, how the banks funded it, and then how much do you charge for the platform to survive uh, for the banks to then continue to use it? That's That's a great question. I mean, in one question you have, me talking for the next 30 minutes again, but uh, Pran, to, to, to cut it short, I think when we started the journey, it started as, as, as a proof of concept, you know, uh, technology was new, new to the region. Uh, banks were getting into a model of this sharing of data they had not done before. So all, all this was very new to them. So, you know, Etasadat, the, the telecom company, um, and now the, the, the enterprise wing of it, which is now known as the EN Enterprise, said, we shall put the whole program together and find a way for, uh, you know, release it as a subscription model for the banks to pay for it. So instead of the banks investing, banks who are helping steer the use case and potential solution, whereas Etisalat EN took the responsibility of developing the platform, investing in it, and then finding a model to charge back. Now, when you ask for the pricing, it's a little sensitive topic, but let me explain how it works. So we have a, a subscription fee on an annual basis, um, which is you know, paid by all the banks and also has an X number of invoices, which are covered as part of the upload. Now, anything beyond that, we charge per invoice. And then there is a ceiling price at which the charges stop. And you could have N number of invoices beyond that. This model helps the largest banks to have been capped. Uh, they, they get capped at a, at a sustainable price. And for the smaller banks to have a very low end subscription fee. And if there is, if the business is good and invoices are more, then they are charged very incrementally you know, per invoice. So that, that this model, again, the pricing model was decided by the consortium. Um, and th this, is, this is how the, the platform is now, now growing with that pricing model. Lovely. Yeah, no, uh, it is a complex one because you've got to manage the uh, three business cases. One to, as you said, create the platform. Uh, and obviously the uh, the local operator took care of that. Then how does it actually become self-funding? Uh, so it's not continuously absorbing more capital to keep it running. And then how do you then get that pricing right, as you said? Uh, complex, but your model sounds very much in the right place. So congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. It was, it was a lot of hard work of the people involved. Some, uh, you know, very smart people like uh, my boss, I wish I was on the call. Um, in, in coming up with this pricing, in, in having, uh, uh, but, you know, the, having the Steerco and the consortium um, running hands in hands is, is, the, is the bigger success. Uh, and then that everything starts falling in place. I have a question, say, why Hyperledger? Yeah, um, yeah I was going to have that inside provocative one. But that's a good one. Why did you choose to go for Hyperledger? So a, a couple of reasons that, that led us to Hyperledger. Uh, of course, the private permission blockchain, um, the, the kind of security and the mindset we had in mind, especially catering to banks, um, the, the benefits of Hyperledger made sense. Uh, our partner in Journey, uh, one of the known names in the Hyperledger world, um, Avanza Innovations was, was, is an expert at, at Hyperledger. Their product Cypher, which is the underlying platform, um, uh, or the underlying framework of the platform, is one of the highest rated uh, um, suite of products in the Hyperledger world. So uh, it was just putting all of that uh, together. Uh, uh, it, we didn't think that this was a public uh, blockchain play. It was, it had to be managed um, and it was um, a privileged entry to the club as opposed to keeping it open. So that's that's how the Hyperledger story came about. Thanks for saying. The reason on the question from my friend Iham from Turkey, is that solution for local trade transactions? Yes. Yes. So local trade, as I said, as far as the borrower or the borrowing is in the country, uh, then irrespective of if the transaction is domestic or foreign, 
um, banks have decided to put their invoices as a last mile check through the platform. So it could be an invoice, which is a parcel of an LC transaction. They still check it against our, our, our platform because somebody else or the same company could present it elsewhere as an open account transaction. So, you know, we still, to cover the blind spot, it just, just makes a lot of sense to have that. Clayton says, will Hyperledger EBLs be interoperable with DDoCs EBLs? Yeah, this I is think a very this is a nice question. question. It was going yeah. on in space as well. Yeah, I think that's a question for you. I think so. Hi, can Wait, I ask a question? Ask a question? Uh, how many banks are operating nodes? Every bank has a peer node. So right now, nine banks. All nine of them have peer nodes. Uh, hi, you were just telling about uh, your advisor from Cypher. Can you please repeat his name, please? His name, please. Avanza Innovations. Uh, okay, oh. Evanza. Evanza. Avanza. A V A N Z A. Avanza Innovations. Okay. It's a Dubai-based company. Got it. I can share the link to the video and uh, um, I can also, uh, I think, uh, yeah, Andrea, when, when I give the presentation to you, that time I can share the link as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll share it on the LinkedIn side of the Happy Ledger Supply Chain and Trade Fund SIG. And also I will reshare the record on today's meeting where you can, you can visualize, you can watch the video shared by Hussein. There is another question I'm saying from uh, Gigo Joseph. You run so nodes run banks or do the run on their behalf? This is a technical question, basically. That's so you know, we, we are blessed. We are, we are blessed to be part of a telecom operator that also has their own data centers and cloud services. So what we have today is we run the nodes on their behalf, but they're all network segmented and you know, virtually separate and all of that good stuff is done, right? So the, the, it, as if it's it's in that they are in their own private cloud, every node. But there are some banks who have expressed the interest. Um, and again, this is a technological evolution across the globe where, where banks are saying, we would like to take ownership of, of our uh, nodes and, you know, make it. Um, but again, given given the time, given the the readiness, it made sense to also be the infra provider at that point in time. So we could we could um, make sure that the use case sees the day of light. Are we looking to partner with other blockchain yeah. consortiums? Yeah. 100%, 100%. Good, good question by Abhishek. Yeah, we, we are continuously evaluating and um, you know we have been invited by and we are inviting uh, consortiums where it makes sense to, to collaborate. There are quite a few within the country. There are quite a few around the region. And then of course, the, the larger global players as well. Hussein, just a question just from my question. young um, you, you basically focused the presentation on, uh, you see, uh, double spending, uh, anti-fraud, stuff like this. Uh, mm -hmm. From a technological perspective, you know, you have blockchain, but you have other related technology that work in this space. How do you see the interaction in the future between these technologies? And how do you see them collaborating to solve the problem related to fraud and to double spending? Are you, are you talking about related technologies like artificial intelligence, for example? Yeah, exactly. Machine learning, natural language processing. You see, I'm so, using all the, on the documentary credits, not all the open accounts, but also invoice authenticity and stuff like this. So this, this is, I mean, goes, goes without saying, the, the platform has all the capabilities built in uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I mean, it, as you know, the journey is about 14, 15 months old. Uh, so some of the AI is still in the learning mode, but what we do have is we have put together a, a you know a few AI based rule sets um, around the supply line of business, around the product price check, and it's it's curating its own database, and it's it's coming to 
a point where we have started seeing some of the early results. And this is AI, right? It needs to have a lot more data. It needs to ingest so much more data for it to become smarter. So um, we're creating our own models. We are continuously analyzing the, the data output. The, the data scientist side of things is, is heavily involved in looking at uh, different angles. And we're continuously evolving our, our AI models. We, we believe that you know, we would come to a point where depending on the trends and understanding, um, the AI would help us predict uh, some of these potential uh, frauds and some of these potential trends that we miss out otherwise. So we'll get there very soon. No, can we use only e-invoice on our platform? Do you mean if, I mean, if there are, there are multi-mode or multi, yeah, there, there's, there's multi modes of interacting with the platform. So um, there is an, just like you have a paper invoice, we have exactly the same UI and you can go in and punch in, 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 in your fields, right? Let's say if you're typing it, for the smaller units who are just having a couple of uh, invoices a day or so, they may prefer to do it. There's a lot of fancy front-end client-based checks um, available. It's a browser-based application, becomes very interactive. That's model one. Model two is when you have um, you know, a list of invoices, CSV, and uh, mass upload them for mass tracking. The third model is where you put in a PDF or a JPEG and the system does OCR. You confirm the OCR and it goes through the same drill. And the fourth one, which is being used by the larger banks. In fact, most of our banks are converting to having their systems integrated via you know, API. Our platform is microservices oriented. So um, everything is available through an API call. So they are integrating to send uh, heaps of data into our platform and then get real time output uh, and feed uh, their operators real-time information to uh, for instant decision making. So the platform has has um, you know quite a bit of uh... okay. Sarth noted. Sorry, uh, Usain, can I interrupt for a minute? Yes, please, Sarth. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Ozan, just have one query. Uh, with respect to Hyperledger, we will be using Ethereum. How do you find the transactions per second as such? You know, like, you know, how how it, you know, impacts the trade finance transactions as such? Like, you know, uh, with respect to the current infrastructure, are we, you know, able to sustain that, you know, with the volumes keeps increasing? So far, we have not hit any, um, any roadblock in terms of performance. Um, but again, I mean, it's, it's, a, it, at the end of the day, it's, it's tables and, you know, it's rows and columns, and it also depends on how smartly you have designed them, but from a hyper ledger perspective and the underlying blockchain perspective, so far, we have not hit any performance issues and we don't anticipate, um, it has been, it has been so far very smooth. And we believe as we continue scaling the way we have designed our architecture, we don't seem to be getting there um, anytime soon with a performance issue. It's very oh, sorry. oh, sorry. Go ahead. Hello? Yep. Yeah, go ahead. go ahead. You can go ahead. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, one query. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, so, uh, just uh, one final thing is like, uh, I don't, uh, how how we are you know convincing the banks you know, to adapt to this new technology? That's such a very very good question. Um, um, so it it the founding banks was easy. Beyond the founding banks, it was the power of the consortium. See, I, th I think the banks are convinced on two sides of things. One, the the plunge was taken by the, the founding banks, right? They, they created uh, sort of a precedence for the others to follow. The dynamics are changing. All banks are going through digital transformation. And um, 
adopting a platform like ours is a step in that direction. So that that's another um, reason that they have they have uh, they get convinced. And the third is that the value, you know, even if you catch one invoice, and there are banks, I mean, one invoice has just getting themselves saved from that one fraud is is far more value than the than the subscription they pay. Yeah. And uh, yep. so uh, we we don't we don't have a challenge with with banks or the price point. The challenge is the readiness with the bank because you understand when you introduce a process like that, like this. Uh, the banks have to alter their their um, existing processes, and that takes some time. That adoption is the challenge. That cultural shift is a challenge, uh, but it's not. We don't see the challenge with the with the the dimes and the dollars. Okay, awesome, so, lovely. There's a question, Hussein, from uh, Gigo again. Are you planning to open to investors at side banks to come in and bid as well? So banks come in and invest money in the platform. Is that the question? Gigo, you can take the word if you want and answer directly. I think what he's asking is that, are you open for investments besides the bank's investment as well? I think there is, there is no um, stopping of incoming dollars. And this is a fintech, a startup, um, great ambitions. And um, I think that the, the right stakeholders can make the decision, but a, I would not shy away from saying that, you know, we are close to investors. I would not say that. Got it. So Got the, it. There's a question from Tom that says, uh, yeah. different yeah. classes and groups of members who get different decision rights and involvement. How was that decided? So this is a great question. So the, the number of banks we have today, we have a steering committee. Steering committee, all banks are equally represented. Everybody has the same say at the table. Uh, within, under the steering committee, there are three subcommittees. One is the trade finance working group that focuses on the, the product side of things. We also have a compliance working group that is very important because they help us with the regulatory guidelines uh, to be in line with the with with the other requirements in the region, and third is the infosec, which is represented by banks, infosec experts. So these are the three subcommittees, and subcommittees are open to any banks that that want to play a role in it. And um, I believe most of the subcommittees are um, fully presented by all the participating banks on the network. And on the steerco, the only thing that we did little different i mean to drive it to to uh, you know really put it in the in the in the fast lane we had a um, an election very simple election process and we elected co-chairs so you know two people were elected as the chair of the steering committee um, from different banks this was again uh, on a voting system by the represented uh, the presented banks in the network and it's working out really well. Great, thank you. Thanks, Hussein. Can I ask a follow-up question on that here? In terms of the dollars or the uh, UAE dollars that were, were uh, needed to be ponied up at the beginning, how was that decided? Not so much what the dollars were, just you know, did somebody say, hey, I'm going to put, we're going to, the founding members, we each have to put in a hundred thousand and then, you know, we'll get that back later on. Or was it, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out a different way to do that. Um, I don't think there's a, there's a straight answer to that, but I would say that um, Eta Salat or EN is known as, is, is, is a pioneer when it comes to this country. Okay. Uh, from okay. running the, copper lines in the 60s and 70s to running the highest grade fiber in the world today. It was all about innovation. It was all about emerging technologies. But the, the, the thing was, it was not about just saying, oh, it's blockchain, you know, let's rally behind it. It's AI, let's rally behind it. No, what is the real problem we are going to solve? Does it have a value? Is it tangible? And is it is it gonna aid the community and the nation at large? There's always this, this, this idea about 
you know, how it will help the, at, at the national level, how it will help the nation. And I think that was, that was the, the noble thinking behind investing in, in such a project. Because, I mean, this could take any shape. This could have died six months back or, you know, uh, would have no future. But just getting the results out, being patient with it, um, and now seeing the platform in going in so many different directions, helping connect, you know, all the loose ends, I think is the, is the real value that uh, I'm sure, you know, the, the country and the leadership is so visionary. So people at the higher positions saw this as a vision and allowed um, you know, our team to, um, to come up with a platform uh, that could someday, and it's already becoming you know, you know, a nationwide uh, success. Got it, thanks. Got it. It sounds like the key here was there was a champion that really drove this along and, and helped it so that it would really grow and then others could come on board. Yes. Any other questions from the attendants? Sorry, there is an echo today that I don't manage to, to eliminate. I don't know what's going on in the Zoom room. I guess that's it for today. Right, Andrea, no more questions coming in. Yes, no yes. more questions from, from the attendance. It was a very good meeting, by the way, Hussein, and I thank you for this. Thank you for being with us today and sharing see the updates. That was great to, to come to know your experience and value it. Can't wait to, to witness, see what's, what would go on in the future. And let's keep in contact, by the way. Thank you so much for being with us. And see you Thank next you. time in the next meeting. No, really, yep. really appreciate yep. the opportunity and you know, uh, present our, our our it's no more a case study, it's it's it is a successful yeah um, successful story. And it's it's a it's a great learning. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Usain. Now it was really great. It was really nice to you know uh, have that presentation. Thanks for all you know Andrea. patiently answering the queries. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. Andrea, can we have a little background about you? My background? Yeah. Uh, I'm a trade finance professional, uh, sir. Uh, spend most of my time, working time, within multinational companies, to multinational companies. I was deeply based in the Man and region, Africa, of course, the Middle East, because of the business I would do, which was process food technology. And uh, was always, was always say, into trade finance. I got into passionate about that. You are, you are a consultant or you work with a bank? No, no banks. No, no banks. We've always been We've always working, working with working 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 companies. companies. Okay. Okay. And you are also very involved with the hyperledger technologies and blockchain? What's your CBN? I'm saying you are also well versed with the hyperledger solutions? Uh, I'm a volunteer. Uh, I'm a volunteer. Yeah. I'm the, one of the chairs you see of the Hyperledger supply chain trade fund and SIG. We all okay, volunteer. Please share, your please share your contact. I would I would love to get in touch with you. We are building something unique in India uh, for the global markets, and uh, I would be requiring help from our community in the Hyperledger, and uh, again in a financial service. Uh, I'll just share my own mail so you can contact me anytime you like. You'll see here in the chat. That's great. Wonderful. So thank you so much for being with us today and see you in a couple of weeks' time. Next meeting is going to happen on the 26th. We're going to go deeper into the URDTT. We're going to have David Maynell of ICC UK. So this is going to be insightful and I advise you to, to attend. Thanks again, Hussein. It was a great pleasure. Remember, please, to provide the slides that we'll upload on to our wiki page and to our LinkedIn page so everybody can access them and enjoy it. We'll, we'll do that. Andrea, once again, thank you very much to you, Hyperledger Foundation, for this great opportunity. Wonderful.
See you soon again, guys. See you. Bye bye. Thank you, man. Bye, bye, everybody. Bye. bye. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Andrea. Bye, bye, bye Andrea. Thank, thank you so much, Andrea. This is Ihan. Bye, bye. Bye, Ihan. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Usain. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Usain. Bye, bye.